I don't rock with people that practice habitual sin. Right. I can rock with anybody that fell into it. Cause, cause you know you can fall. Right. Like I don't care. You, I know some of y'all. Like you just talked about. They just came off the uh, Daniel fast, the first twenty-one days of January. Satan was there on the twenty-second day. Right. <laughs> Waiting. <laughs> and for some of y'all, it was a burger. For some of y'all, it was a person. Cause when you come off your fast, you're hungry. And you got more than one appetite. But th- th- there's, there's a whole piece here, right? So Jacob, right, he, he wrestles with God. Yep. And the, be- the beautiful thing about as he's wrestling with God, God says, what's your name? And what's beautiful about that is, is God. He knew his name. But so when he says, my name is Jacob, he literally gets him to confess who he is. So Jacob mm-hmm. translates to a trickster. So he says, what's your name? He says, I am Jacob. What is he really saying? I am trickster. Yeah. So then he gets blessed on the other side of it. Blessing falls on confession. It's not just confessing that Jesus is Lord. It's why I need a Lord. For Jacob, it was trickster. For whatever it is for you, whatever, what, what's your real name? Not, not the one you pretend to be, but, but the one that you actually are. So like whatever you're struggling with, let's talk about that. And when you confess that, that's where blessing falls on. Here's what we're talking about. Churches tell you to hide it. If I hide it, you're keeping me from blessing. You can't love me the way that you, you say you love me because there is blessing on the other side of my confession. He says, my name is Jacob. He then says, okay, we're going to change your name and you're blessed as a result of it. He knew his name. He just needed him to admit his name because he cannot bless who you pretend to be, right? We've heard that before. He can only bless who you really are. Now, if we're going to have that conversation, we have to talk about how it has been unsafe for certain people to share their name. Because if I'm being honest, I hear your story and I love it. And we've had these private conversations a good amount. But when I was seven years old and I was taken advantage of by a boy a few years older than me who was experimenting on me and he could say he didn't know what he was doing. And that boy actually came back as a grown man and apologized to me. But when when the people in my life found out about it and we were supposed to talk about it, we didn't. So for you, all the lights went on. For me, the lights went off. So then what happened at seven years old, I just learned how not to talk about it. So then fast forward into my 30s, I have a mental breakdown because my, my, my therapist tells me that it was the combination of COVID and stress-related work and this transition that was happening. So when he sits down with me and my wife and says to me, my first therapy appointment, hey, how was your childhood? It was like, Bleh, and everything comes out that I've been holding on to. Yes, sir. And then so then we begin to navigate through that again. Mm-hmm. And I have a conversation with Timothy Bartholomew Ross. <laughs> and, and he tells me as a grown man, this is, this is a true story. That he tells me as a grown man, well, go back to the people and share with them that you were hurt, that we never spoke about. Mm -hmm. So when I go back, Mm -hmm. which side note, because I repressed those memories, it left me confused. And here's the kind of confusion I dealt with. I was a chubby white boy with a bowl haircut growing up in Queens, New York. I was always the only white kid. On top of that, I was the pastor's kid. I had some stuff working against me. If I now tell people what happened to me when I'm seven, they're going to call me names. And in the 90s, not 2024, where yes, sir. Gen Z talks about it. And, yeah, no. But in the 90s, you're going to be beaten up if you share certain things and they're going to call you names. Yes, sir. So now what do I do? I don't say anything. When I finally do say something, it's in a small group. I'm 12 years old, and a young man weaponizes it against me and then starts molesting me and is behaving in a very evil way. This isn't experimenting. This is blackmail, and it's violent. And if you don't do what I say, I'm going to tell people X, Y, and Z. Now, I went along with it because I was so scared. You were 12. I was 12, and, and I already learned the lesson when I was seven 
Because it did come out and nobody did nothing. Correct. So now fast forward to an adult, it comes out. I speak to Tim and my wife mm -hmm. and they encourage me, hey, sit down with those people and have that conversation. And I do. Mm -hmm. And guess what? No lights go on. Correct. There were excuses made. Correct. Someone says, I didn't know. The other one says, that's just what boys do. So, so when, we're, when we're having this conversation, we have to make room for the people who know that confession can be unsafe. Correct. Confessing correct. to God is always safe. Absolutely correct. But you better find the right people to confess to. Because what I've learned in my life at 12, if I confess it to the wrong person, he's going to weaponize it against me, and then he's going he's gonna to abuse me as a result of it, which, side note, coming to find out that, that he went on to abuse several others in his lifetime, by the way, some that were either, even also underage. But then the people that were supposed to protect me, that were supposed to be my safe place, did nothing about it. So you know what I found out in my late 30s? Confession isn't always safe. Correct. But it wasn't until I processed with my therapist, who's a Christian therapist, by the way, and my wife, who's my best friend, and my brother, Tim. The conversation helped me so much because I was able to confess to people, here it is, that were strong enough to handle it. Tim, I've heard you share your story so many times because I'm also a dweller. Mm -hmm. And I listen to all the podcasts. And when me and Jairus go to the gym, we listen to you. And our way back home from the gym, we listen to you. And when I hear you share your story, I'm thinking, I have moments where I envy you. That's, that sounds weird to say out loud. But I actually like saying it out loud because it's fair to say not everyone has the same story. Correct. However, here's the good news. We could have the same outcome. Absolutely you find correct. the right people and you are big enough to work through your pain, you will be able to deal with it. But here's the truth. You have to talk through it. You can't talk around it. And we have too many people trying to talk around trauma and trying to talk around pain. And they're trying to put Jesus glitter on it and say, if you come in an altar call in the name of Jesus, you're going to be healed from. But you're not going to be healed from trauma or offense or any other pain by just someone laying their hand on you. I need you to put your hand on this conversation and be big enough to grip it so that we could sit. And if you need to apologize, you apologize. And if you need to take some ownership, you take some ownership. But what we're not going to do is going to respond to someone's pain with excuses. Yes, right. Because I promise you that will never work. Yep. And in this season of my life, if I'm going to be somebody that reaches this city with all the, the church hurt that exists in this city, if we're being honest, we're going to have to be big enough to wrap our arms around all of it and make space for the conversations. Not bash, but heal. Yeah. Because we're going to have to chop away at it in order to heal from it and, and we're also going to have to give people the space to, to, to trust the people that they're talking to. Which, by the way, thank you for being such a trustworthy friend yeah. to Jairus and I and Dylan and Chloe, by the way, because <laughs> it, was, it was our moments talking. Yep. It was me sleeping in your house yep. mm -hmm. <laughs> so that we could hang out and, and, and have conversations and, mm -hmm. or not talk at all. and just yep. Sit. Sit. Yeah. I, I, I love you. I love you. I love you so much. And, and thank you for the gift of your vulnerability. Mm. Because to my knowledge, you have never shared what you just shared publicly. Correct. So I want to I want to say a couple of things um, about the Durso family. I love this entire family. I know them all. I love them all. And I also want to say that when you boldly and bravely own your narrative, one of the lies of the enemy 
will be to say you cannot share the full narrative because you're going to make other people look bad. Here is what, what, what one of my dear friends told me. If you don't like the story I told, you shouldn't have played the part you played. In me sharing my story, you could conclude Tim's mom and dad didn't keep an eye on him. They left him unprotected. Right. No, no. My parents had their own brokenness, as I found out later. You could hear Chris's story and be like, what does that mean for, mm -hmm. why couldn't, how come they're not turning on the lights? You know how scary it is to turn on the lights when you've lived in the dark? If you get around with the lights off in your own house, middle of the night, does anybody want to turn on all the lights to go, to, to go pee? <laughs> middle of the night, you're going off muscle memory. <laughs> if you don't think you walk by faith, that two o'clock in the morning pee, I don't even know if I open my eyes. I'm like It's seven steps to the left, <laughs> two to the right. Turn around and I, and I sit down when I pee. So uh, it just kills the splash rate. I'm just saying. I'm trying to give a life hack to some men in here. Cleaning around that bowl. Just sit down. It's the middle of the night. Who's trying to aim at 2 a.m.? I'm sitting down. Um, there's a revelation that's hitting the room right now. I just felt the atmosphere shift. Y'all get it. So, um, and for those saying TMI, it's TIM. So, um, <laughs> Great. it's just me. But when you have that bravery and you have that boldness, you give yourself the opportunity to show grace to others who right. for whatever reason can't find it within themselves. They see your lights come on and actually triggers them to run further into the dark. I, I know for a fact, because I've, I've, I've seen it around the room, some of so many of y'all wiping tears from your eyes as we're sharing what we're sharing because it's pulling on a cord that you're familiar with. It's a beautiful thing to get in touch with that, but it can be scary if, if you're not ready to fully unpack it. 